G'day guys, welcome to the Noob Spiro podcast. I'm your host Shrek and today you're in for a treat. We are off to interview the author of Longer and Deeper, Dr. Yat Vabas. And uh, this is a good one, especially I, I get out a little bit. I apologise in advance for that. But uh, look, if you're new to the show today, Turbo and I head all around the world interviewing spearfishing experts, authorities and characters and sort of just dialing in on their tips, tricks and actionable insights to help make you a better Spiro. Now, if you're an old soap and you've been listening for 95 of these suckers, then welcome back. It's great to have you with us. Just want to send out some love and thank all the people that have been sharing the show with others, especially on the socials and stuff lately. So it's great to have growth in the show and, and see new people coming in. And I uh, just want to thank you guys for that. So, yeah, look. We're going to get into Dr. Yarpa Bus. Who is he? He's uh, got a PhD from Simon Fraser University in geology. He's uh, done some phenomenal research and papers. He's got an extremely experimental mindset. Very clever guy, but also very practical. And uh, in a short history freediving, he only started in 2013. He has come a hell of a long way. And this book is without any fluff. It's completely actionable from start to finish and uh, he, he, he's the founder of Freedive Wire so it's one of the most comprehensive and influential freediving sites on the internet. They've got a hell of a lot of really good articles on there for free so go and check that out, Freedive Wire. Um, I'd encourage you to do that and um, so today what do we talk about? Now I geek out, out of it because Yarp sent me a copy of this book about Ooh, before Christmas, and so I had time to, to ease my way into it, and uh, I was thoroughly impressed, because I've read a couple of these books, and uh, some of them are not so actionable, they're more like, a, like reading through like a medical textbook or something, and this one is not like that at all, although there is some physiology in there and some big concepts, it's kind of broken down into really um, actionable information, it's great for Spiros, so it's actually, this whole book is about cross-training for spearfishing, about improving your breath hold and your physiology, so um, yeah, there's, there's, we, we go through a, a lot of the core concepts of the book today, talk about the exercises, the diet, some of the myth busting he did in the book. Uh, I asked him random questions about his life and stuff, and we uh, learned a little bit about free dive wire as well. But um, hypoxic squats, you, you might be thinking to yourself, what the hell are they? Yeah, me too. Um, stay tuned. L listen in for that. It's bloody interesting. Uh, yeah. Hey, look. Another couple of quick shout outs before we get into this interview. RLM, uh, 99 tips to get better at spearfishing on Amazon. He said, uh, sorry, Spiro Log on Amazon. He says, very helpful book with all the place, places needed for the important information. Great book at a fair price. Uh, Fox says, this book appeared on my doorstep within two days. It's a nice tool to use. It has plenty of pages to log many dives. Now, Spiro Log, what is it? It's a log book for your spearfishing dives. So basically, like, you know what conditions and stuff work in your spot. And at certain times of the year, certain fish run through, and that's when you're going to get them. If you can keep a fishing log of a local area, you will start to notice some of the key factors that are allowing those things to happen. So I'd highly recommend you jump on Amazon and get a copy of our Spiro log that was made with the help of a couple of legends uh, from around the world and former guests. So, yeah. Uh, shout out to Sam Dale. Now, Duncan Henderson's taken him under his wing, shot his first butterfish last week. Stoked to hear that. G'day, Sam. Uh, also, 99 tips to get better at spearfishing.com.au. Uh, actionable. A fantastic book full of useful and actionable information. A must for Spiros. Also, Simon Clark said, some great advice for all Spiros. I highly enjoyed and recommend this book. Take what you need from it and enjoy yourself. Now, yeah, look, uh, 99 Tips to Get Better at Spearfishing is available in a few formats. There's an unillustrated guide on Amazon, which is an ebook, or you can get the audio book, which is Turbo and Me reading it out. We, you can actually get that for free. So go into today's show notes and there'll be an audible link there. You sign up for a free month trial and you can get your hands on our book for nothing. Or um, the hardcover is available in some spearfishing retailers and the soft cover is still up there on Amazon.com. Hey, look, I didn't come to spruik the book today. I came to just get into this interview. But just one last thing before we get there, Patreon. We are now live on Patreon. We're getting $49 per episode from eight patrons. Thank you, legends, for supporting the New Sphere podcast. You are the motor keeping us moving. And if you've been listening to the show for a while, I'd encourage you to jump on there. Um, there's three different levels, $2, $5, $10. Your support will be well, well received. And if we 
make start making 250 bucks an episode, we're going to start pumping one of these out every week instead of once every fortnight. So that could be something you're interested in. All right, let's hook into this interview with Dr. Yarp for Bus. Today's Dynamite Noob Spiro podcast is brought to you by spearfishing.com.au. That's right, the fine folks over at Adreno have been supporting the Noob Spiro podcast since about episode 18. And they help pay the bills around here. Just want to encourage you to check out spearfishing.com.au and use the code Noob Spiro. You can save 20 bucks on every purchase over 200. But it's just a great online shopping experience. The reviews are phenomenal. If you want to check out a new spear gun, new pair of booties, new pair of gloves, someone's used them before, they've written a review, it's on their website, it's all there, right for, there for you. Head along to spearfishing.com.au and thank you for shopping with it. Today's major sponsor, Adrena. All right, g'day Noob Spiro community. Welcome to the Noob Spiro podcast. Uh, I'm joined today by Yarp Verbus, originally from the Netherlands, but now residing in Canada. I recently picked up his book, Longer and Deeper, and I've had a few discussions with my community about it. So it's uh, interesting and uh, and good to finally get you here, Yarp. How are you? Thanks, I'm good. Good. Looking forward to uh, to your questions. Okay, cool. So Tell us a little bit about where where you're from and uh, what you do, how you got started freediving. Uh, so I moved to Canada in 2012 uh, to uh, pursue a PhD in geology. So I'm a geologist by trade. Um, and during my time here, in, I think in 2013, I started, uh, started freediving. And um, that's obviously led to, uh, I guess you could call it a bit of an obsession, but uh, <laughs> I love the diving and... Uh, uh, I try to be in the water as much as I can, and uh, you know I've, I was building websites before that. That's it's so it kind of all led to free dive wire, and then and then the book, etc. Nice. Um, uh, we could geek out on websites. I might do that later with you. I, I don't mind playing around with them myself. Um, although our, yeah, no, our websites just had a bit of an upgrade, but um, free dive wire as well. Tell us a bit about that. It's a um, it's an awesome blog. I, I've, I've come across it several times and uh, I've been impressed with the quality of the content I've read, but I haven't, I don't follow it avidly. And in the last week or so, since I knew I was going to chat with you, I've had a good look at it. But um, tell us a little bit about it. What's, what's Freedive Wire? What's the deal there? What's the deal there? Well, uh, you know, when I started Freedive Wire, I started it really to be um, a, a sort of a community website where people could uh, log dive sites. And that was because I found it hard to really scout for new dive sites. So it's uh, what it was supposed to be and what it has turned into are really different. And <laughs> I realized, uh, you know, after after uh, I guess half a year or so, that people were more interested than, the, than in, in the articles I was writing than in trying to log dive sites and uh, and and um, and communicating with each other through yet another website. So then I turned it around to really just be a blog. And, um, I, you know, I, I try to write uh, things with a slightly different perspective on, on the norm. So uh, to give uh, people a bit of a, a new perspective or, you know, add a level of complexity, if you will, to, uh, to things that we kind of take for granted in our diving. And that's, that's kind of what I enjoy doing and uh, what I enjoy reading about. So that's naturally what I write about. No, awesome, awesome. I, I, I'm amazed how far you've come in five years. Like your knowledge of freediving is um, you've kind of gone from zero to Ferrari speeds, I think, after reading your book. But I really liked the, your book because it's um, completely different than the other some of the other freediving books I've read in the fact that it's, it's, it's almost like um, – 100 percent just just action oriented and uh i want to get a little bit more into kind of your experimental mindset and, and and how your approach is but before that like what kind of hurdles did you face when you started freediving so 2013 uh it's been five years so that's still fresh for you as well um what are the things you found the most difficult yeah the for me um you know i think we all we all run into different issues but i guess i'm uh pretty normal in the sense that I've struggled a lot with equalization, uh, not so much at the uh, uh, right at the start. So I was able to do some form of frenzel equalization, uh, but uh, but it wasn't perfect. And that it held me back from going past 15 meters 
uh, for a long time, or what felt like a long time. I guess it wasn't. It was probably about a year or so. Um, <laughs> well, and, no, that that uh, can be. That, that is a long time when you're really trying to do something. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's it. So and um, uh, and then my next. Um, uh, that was, I think, it was partly my soft palate and me just maybe I wasn't closing my throat uh, like I should have. Uh, so I was doing some form of frenzy, but I don't think it was perfect. And um, and t- trying to control my soft palate was actually uh, I found that really hard at the start, and it uh, got me into trouble again uh, together with. Um, uh, you know how your your tongue can actually lock into position and keep, uh, say, two compartments of air in your in your uh, in your mouth. If you don't occasionally loosen that, then um, then you won't have that air available to uh, to equalize. And that was again that was another issue for me when I got around 25 meters. I okay. can. Yeah, and then at 35 meters it was mouthfeel, and I I think I have. Um, gotten by all those now finally uh, but uh, um, uh, right now it's I really just need to get into some warm water if I want to try to get to additional depth or dive time. Yeah yeah and being landlocked you know looking for opportunities for depth and work on your equalizing techniques is probably a huge thing you, I mean we talked to Ted Hardy from Immersion Freediving mean, he's got a really good um, online course that we always point people to um, to learn Frenzel. How did you because, like, I, I started reading, um, uh, I think it's Eric Fatar's book, and, I mean, he even called the technique the Frenzel Fatar, I think, for a while. But I, I sort of got right into the mechanics of, of learning it and realised that I already did Frenzel. Um, although yeah, I still that's, don't... that's great. <laughs> I still don't think my technique is perfect either, but I haven't really pushed depth. I think, I'm on, you know, my... You know, my greatest depth so far has probably been 30 meters, and it wasn't even like a an intentional thing. Um, I've never really tried the you know the freediving depth discipline, so I haven't had to run in, into problems like mouthful and the higher end of equalizing problems. How did you overcome, you know, some of the the deeper equalizing issues that you encountered? Or what what were the resources you used and and or coaches and things like that? Um, well, uh, Eric Fadaz's uh, document really helped me. Uh, to get that soft ballot figured out in the end. Um, he wrote a document on equalizing, which uh, that, I guess that's the one you're referring to. Uh, it's separate from the book, but uh, I think you can still find it online in several places. Yeah, it was it was definitely an online document. It was heavy going, and it was a few years ago. And I noticed in your book you refer to some of his stuff as well, so that's kind of why I brought it up, but yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, yeah. So we we do actually have uh, just just to uh, um, give you uh, some of that background. We do have uh, depth here right outside. Oh. Um, we've got you know great spots to train for depth, but the issue is that the water below the thermocline, which is usually around ten meters, and in winter it's uh, there is no thermocline. It's cold all the way around. It's about eight degrees Celsius, and uh, you know it's 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 pretty hard. Uh, the visibility is also quite. Four. So it's hard to train uh, for depth and to gradually make your way into depth when you get um, uh, when you're just you know fighting fighting the cold. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, on Eric Fadas' book, by the way, it was actually uh, in part uh, it was Eric that uh, inspired me to really uh, really dig deep into the science behind all this. He's based in Vancouver as well. Oh wow! Yeah. So where, where's he from? His name sounds Arabic. Is he Egyptian or? Uh, I'm not sure about his ethnic background, but uh, he's, as far as I know, he's lived in Vancouver his whole life. For at the very least, he's lived there for uh, for for the past years. It's interesting because you read a document by a person online, and then you you wonder actually who they are, and you you kind of have these assumptions in your mind about who they are. Probably the same with Yap for bus. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> uh, all right, no. So so you found his document online, and you also read his book. Um, so that were the major things that made the difference for overcoming these sort of these deeper equalizing issues. Yeah, I think his uh, his equalizing document really helped me. Apart from that, it was also just you know a lot of repetitive dives to where I was having trouble and trying to figure out what was going wrong. At one point, I realized I was using um, I was using a mask with a nose pocket that was slightly too small, and my soft palate was closed, and that co- created. A vacuum, if you will, between um, uh, in in my nose, so I couldn't open my soft palate anymore. Would never have been able to get air in my uh, 
in my ears. So I just have to switch masks at, at one point as well. And that it's very hard to find out what's going wrong until you really, you know, try to uh, change all the variables. Yeah. I think for a lot of, you know, Spiros, like we don't, we're not really pushing, you know, that much depth, although there are definitely a, a portion of guys that do. Um, so it's kind of an uncommon issue for, for a vast majority of us. But it's interesting to hear, um, you know, how you overcome those issues yourself. So reading and then sort of going to those depths and just trying to figure out what's going on with your body was kind of your technique. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it's definitely, uh, if, you're, if you're spearfishing, of course, you've got uh, uh, different things to, uh, to focus on and you don't always need to get to depth. But, you know, unfortunately, we're not allowed to spear a lot here uh, because of uh, the regulations. Uh, the best fish that we would like to get, they're actually, um, we need to drive quite a ways and take take a ferry or two uh, in order to, uh, yeah, in order to even uh, be allowed to spear them. So I don't end up spearing a whole lot. Okay. All right. Well, tell us a little bit about your spearfishing. So you got started freediving five years ago. What about spearfishing? Yeah, I tried that, uh, I think, uh, shortly, probably about a year in or so, I... Uh, uh, I started and uh, bought uh, this uh, terrible spear gun. That uh, uh, it, yeah, it was it was a terrible thing, and uh, I can't quite recall what brand it was, but it seemed like uh, it seemed like it had a safety that worked as a trigger, and uh, uh, I mean you could spear something with it, but you had to be really really careful. Um, uh, got got some some flounder and uh, greenling, you know, local fish here, and uh, did like the spear fishing a lot. But I, I, at some point, I realized that you know the dealing with the um, uh, the actual rope uh, that the spear is attached to here is is more of a hassle than just trying to go with a pole spear because the fish uh. in this cold water they they don't move very fast. It's not like being in the tropics where you know a spear or a fish might stay just out of reach of your uh, spear gun if it's seen spears before or has been shot at before yeah yep. so right now i just i yeah, i always dive with a pole spear now oh, or i awesome. always spear with a pole spear yeah cool uh, i mean uh, it's something that guys explore to improve even in the tropics because it's a much harder um tool to use um but um what 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 pole spear are you using have you got like an eight foot ten foot um using a prang uh, yeah i had a six foot collapsible um before that uh was also again was a terrible spear there's not a lot of spear fishing shops where you can get good gear here yeah yeah so we're kind of at the mercy of of of, uh, of amazon and um <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so i tried that collapsible thing and that fell apart in the water practically we, we caught some fish with it but um uh, right now i'm using a fiberglass six foot uh a six foot spear yeah okay cool cool and that, they're, they're perfect for things like flounder, which um, rely on camouflage more than, um, you know, um, staying away from you kind of thing. So Yeah, totally. Yeah, they're, uh, honestly, shooting a flounder is kind of like shooting a, shooting a pancake at point blank. Yeah, you've still got to spot them. You yeah, you still have to see them, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, you, you love eating your local fish as well? What's your kind of your go-to? Yeah, Totally. Yeah, um, if uh, uh, we, we um, you know, last year we had uh, we did a spearing trip with a couple a couple friends and uh, ended up catching quite a, a good meal of fish. So we uh, had uh, ten people over and ended up making a uh, Indian fish curry. Uh, we ended up breading some and frying it. Uh, made ceviche and so we made it in different ways. And that's that's all Perfect. food I love. It's a it's a real um, pleasure. It's a really pleasurable part of spearfishing. I think is feeding people. Um, with, yeah, totally. With, with something is. you caught yeah. yourself. Yeah. All right, cool. Hey, look, I want to chat about your book, and that's most of what I got you on the show for because I think it's a bloody good book, and um, I re I think a big difference about your book is um, kind of your mindset and the way you went about it. You you seem to have this real experimental mindset, and I was wondering how you acquired it and. Um, I noticed a lot of things in there that seem to maybe even indicate that you are a fan of Tim Ferriss. Is, is that <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, it's funny that uh, you would pick up on that. Um, I guess you, you're a fan yourself. I am, I am. Uh, 
<laughs> I am. I actually I read his book uh, shortly before I came to Canada, and then uh, it's kind of funny when I, when I came to Canada, I'd never really done much self experimenting uh, in any way. I think, and uh, came here. And a big part of our diet in the Netherlands is bread, and I just didn't like the bread here. So I thought, okay, I'm going to try to, you know, figure something out where I don't have to eat bread at all. Um, here's Tim Ferriss' book and the slow carb diet. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I ended up trying that, and, yeah. uh, and I actually did uh, lose some weight. So I started trying his other techniques. I did the 20 minute sleep schedule. You know, 20 minutes of sleep for every four hours. Uh, that worked like a charm. It was kind of hard to get into, and uh, but it did work. And um, it was po polyphasal, uh, I'm not doing that. polyphasal sleep. Yeah, that's right. Oh, wow. And uh, I, I stopped doing it uh, at some point because it's pretty hard in your social life, and the nights <laughs> are actually quite boring if you don't sleep. Um, <laughs> yeah, it yeah. works. So. I tried. I tried this. It, yeah, it did work. Uh, yeah, and I, I tried this exercise. Uh, uh, routines, etc. So I, I, you know, gain muscle that way, and uh, it was fun. I actually like that. So I guess that methodology comes from him in part. Um, yeah. Look, let, let's dig a little bit into the kind of the the methodology. You've you've adopted it like full on. Like, um, I love it how you're very precise about the tools you use, measuring and sort of quantifying the state you're in now before trying to do some things that will change that and alter it for your benefit. Obviously, in this situation, we're doing it for freediving, and your book is a case and testament to that. Um, kind of walk us through kind of how you approached um, this this book with in terms of you know changing your freediving performance. Um, that's a good question. I don't, you know, I think I started experimenting before I had the idea that I should write a book about that. But um, but okay. I guess at some point that came together. Uh, um, did the, did the, again, this, this was in part, this was, uh, by talking, you know, I, I ran into Eric Fatad at our local, uh, the local spot. We do a lot of depth diving at a few times and I, I chatted with him and, uh, and got inspired to do this. And he, um, or then I, I started to think, well, how do we measure these things? How do you, how can you actually measure how much oxygen you are using and you know ends up you can use an oximeter for that but it but it is tricky to do because of course the measurement is delayed etc and i go into all that with the book and i thought okay well how now can i test how a certain exercise works and first you need to be in some kind of steady state to do that right so you have to keep your diet somewhat consistent before you do it you want to measure at the same time of day um, uh, maybe always after you wake up or always after your breakfast or whatever but as much as you can control the variables, they need to be consistent. And then I start exercising. And then uh, during that time, maybe every week or every two weeks, I'll measure again. Uh, that's uh, and that's that being steady state beforehand and then having uh, the variables controlled as much as you can. And that's it's actually very hard to do because, you know, life gets in the way of these things. Yeah, for sure. Um, we, don't but, uh, we don't live in a laboratory. Mm -hmm. We um, we exactly, we yeah. have a lot of variables in our lives um, determined by a lot of things that are outside of our control. So that's pretty cool. You're able to um, to be able to do it to such an extent and uh, be the crash test dummy, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I mean, it's uh, it makes for funny uh, situations too. My wife would be. You know, she'd walk into the room and I'm there standing in a squat position doing an exhale breath hold and uh, turning purple and she's <laughs> walking by trying trying not to laugh. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's, those, yeah. Those, those things happen. Oh. But, um, yeah, it did, it did work. And, uh, you know, what's important to realize, though, is that it, these things that I did are, of course, experiments with uh, that just me. It's not a controlled group of people for whom all of this would work. So, and that's why it, it's important if you are training um, some specific item of your physiology that you want to uh, somehow keep track of that. Uh, you know, if you're using the book, if you pack on uh, a lot of muscle very quickly, then, uh, then you might need to do way less of a certain exercise than somebody else would. And for some people, like I, I pack on muscle very easily, uh, for me, it's not that necessary to um, do a whole lot of weightlifting for that uh, to train the ATPCP system, as I call it. Yep. 
Um, and for other, for other people that really have a hard time packing on muscle, it might be counterproductive to try to train that because, you know, they'll gain some, but they might uh, be better off actually using a different technique or a different, uh, try, trying to train a different system. So there are some of our physiologies that uh, you kind of have to take into account that, uh, you know, you, you want to train in a way that's productive for yourself too. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, while, while we're there, um, I did have a question from uh, a former guest on the show and a, and a guy that listens to the show regularly, Sven. He says um, he puts on muscle pretty easy. Uh, he, he's of Maori descent and um, he's been wanting to sort of strip a bit of muscle off, I think. Um, uh-huh. And your book sort of challenged a few of his ideas, I think. Um, can, can you speak to that a little bit? Like, um, can you have too much muscle mass with, with freediving? When does it sort of become, um, yeah. you know, like your muscles are just too hungry for oxygen and things like that? You know, I think, I think uh, um, it's a good question. And a lot of, uh, of freedivers uh, have, have that same... Um, uh, sense that it, that you know uh, whatever tissue you have will use a bit of oxygen and therefore it might become um, uh, counterproductive to train for more. But what I found was that uh, when I did pack on muscle, I ended up uh, uh, desaturating my blood less than uh, before I had that, and um, and that's that's written in the book as well. But ah, okay. of course, what you have to what you, what you do have to realize is that um, uh, some uh, uh, blood quality, et cetera, yeah. that is actually trained more by cardio than by weightlifting. Yeah, yeah. So, it, um, so if you have, uh, if you do cardio, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the markers in athletes, like endurance athletes are much better um, when you think of it in, in terms of freediving and spearfishing, because endurance athletes usually have higher blood quality, they have more myoglobin, and they have better CO2 tolerance. So oh, wow. if you spend if you spend a lot of time lifting weights, you know, uh, and you don't really uh, uh, keep you don't maintain that side of your aerobic performance, then it might become counterproductive. Yeah, right. But the muscle itself. Um, it's not as if having a bigger muscle will naturally, you know, really affect your freediving performance uh, much. I think it's, uh, uh, I think that's that's a bit of a myth because a muscle does store some energy and some oxygen, and uh, you know that's that's both of those you're you're going to use during your dive too. Yeah, I think I read in your book like 30, 35 percent of the oxygen your body uses on a freediver is actually stored in the muscles and stuff is that is that have i got that correct i think it's a little less than that but it's but it's still it is quite a bit okay and uh it's um uh myoglobin the, so that's the uh, the the uh compound in the muscles that, that uh basically brings oxygen from the um uh, from the blood vessels into the mitochondria in the muscle cells. That's what myoglobin's function is. So it's located in the cells themselves exactly. And it's it's very hard to figure out how to train to increase those levels. Yeah, I, I got that I, from your section in the book talking about myoglobin because it, it confused me a bit and I, I, I didn't really... I'm flat out understanding hemoglobin, to be honest, and just you know, blood, you know, red blood cell volume and 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 size. Like um, um, from for from a personal level, I've had trouble with lo- low iron levels and um, oh, yeah. and red blood cell volume, and so CO two training and stuff like that actually does wonders for me. Um, and oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, and so, but it's it's interesting. Like every, like you say, everyone's kind of a case by case basis. Um, so this myoglobin, um, do your hypoxic squats? Do you believe that they increase the amount of myoglobin? Well, that's that's a good question, and I, I actually did a, a webinar on myoglobin um, uh, for the um, um, the inventor of uh, a Nares machine, which is a near infrared. Uh, spectrometry gizmo. It's basically a machine you can strap on any muscle and then it measures the amount of uh, oxygen in that muscle. Okay. And it measures a combination of uh, it measures a combination of hemoglobin 
and myoglobin oxygenation. So um, what I did was I spent quite some time in, uh, in a physiologic testing lab with that thing strapped to my leg to find out, you know, how do you actually desaturate a muscle of oxygen? And I haven't, you know, I can't with that, I can't test whether I'm going to increase myoglobin, but I can test uh, what uh, is very unlikely to increase myoglobin. So, uh, and because of that, uh, or uh, the way I should say that, of course, is that it's it's very unlikely that you're going to generate more myoglobin if you don't desaturate it periodically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So working and, it just uh, like a muscle, putting it under stress, and, and exactly, yeah, and and then hoping that because the it's not coping with the demands you're putting on it, that it, that the body will send a signal to increase the amount stored. Is that is that kind of right? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. And long runs or long bike rides, you know, they uh, they train that as well. But uh, as you know, some uh, free divers have their uh, uh, they're, they're a bit worried about training too much cardio because they're worried that they're going to burn too 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 much oxygen. I don't think that's an issue for uh, most uh, most spiros and free divers, but uh, it might be for those top level athletes. Um, Regardless, the only exercise that I could find that did desaturate uh, muscle oxygen uh, by a lot was the hypoxic squats. Um, and I tried apnea walks. I tried uh, single leg stands. I tried sprints. I tried sprints uh, on breath hold. Uh, and, and your body is simply too good at bringing oxygen to where it's needed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you, you know, that's... And, um, so those hypoxic squats, they work wonders for me, but they uh, they are the, probably the trickiest uh, exercise in the book to implement. Okay, um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to explain it, but I want to just preface it with, by telling people that are listening, telling our, uh, our clever listeners, be very careful with this one because uh, it's, it's a recipe for a blackout if you don't do it supervised and with a bit of... Uh, understanding because that's kind of what can happen how, how do you do a hypoxic squat all right so a, a hypoxic squat uh is a um it's really a series of squats that you do on exhale breath holds so there's three parts to this there's a recovery um there is a uh, uh a breath hold which is a static so usually i uh i just lie down on, on the couch or bed uh, while I'm doing the static part, and it might be 20 seconds or 15 seconds. Um, and then uh, I get up into a squat position while still holding my breath, and then I'll, I'll hold the squat for a certain amount of seconds. Um, when And I, I set a timer for this. I use a Runtastic timer, which has the, those three uh, parts to it, so it, it just tells you when to do things. Um, that then... Uh, that you do in a series of uh, 12 or so. And the reason you want to do a series uh, is that you want to bypass the um, production of creatine phosphate in the muscles. And that takes about three minutes to regenerate. So you want to keep the recovery phase less than one and a half minutes. Okay. Um, well. What I do uh, at, during that whole time, I measure my... Um, oxygen saturation, and I try to uh, I try to time it so that I reach maybe eighty percent oxygen saturation, which is which should be well above uh, a blackout for everyone. But um, but you have to gauge this as you go because that measurement is delayed, right? So it takes quite a few tries before you get your timing right. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's it. it's it's a series of twelve squats that way. Okay. So I'll just like from what I understood. Okay, you, you exhale and you hold while you're sitting or laying and then you get up after 20 seconds and you do you squat and hold that position. That's right. And it's, and it's just a body weight squat. You don't want to have any weights on you yeah. for this one. And then at the end of that hold, then you stand up and you start breathing again for maybe one and a half no, minutes. But, but, yeah, what I, what I do is I immediately uh, I just kind of fall back and, or sit back down so that because um, if you stand and you start uh, breathing, then um, you're, it's a bit more likely that you might pass out. So you're better off sitting down. So you, do you do some hook hook breaths? 
Uh, I don't during this because there's there's no real uh, uh, there's no real pressure change. So I just try to breathe quickly. Okay. And um, yeah, there's no need to breathe really slow or really fast. You just want to breathe as your body tells you to. All right. And um, okay. And you talked about measuring oxygen saturation. So what's kind of like um, a general rule of thumb for your blackout threshold? Like how far down? Can you take your oxygen saturation before your body sends that message to switch you off? <laughs> uh, um, well, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't recommend anybody trying to find that number. But, uh, <laughs> no. it, uh, for for me and for some others that um, that I've talked to, the number tends to be around forty percent. Uh, um, that though, the tricky thing is here, and there are again, there's a, there's a lot of tricky stuff when it comes to oximeters because they need a steady heartbeat to measure your saturation, uh, and they are very unreliable when you get to the low end of what they can measure. Okay. So by the time you're at 50, uh, you know, you uh, or or even 60, those numbers can really change pretty quickly. So if you're looking at the oximeter and that thing is going down to 60 or, or even lower then you're in you're in, you're well in the danger zone D does your body um reduce in saturation with like a bell curve or or you know is, it's not like a steady state like depletion does it does it have some variance in the curve as well as the problems with measuring it um that's a good question it uh you know i think you're and, and of course, again, it's that curve might look different than um, than it should be in a way because there is that effect of uh, of, of vasoconstriction and less perfusion to your your fingers. So um, I found that in general, with me, the measurement is about 20 seconds delayed. So I I get the lowest reading 20 seconds or so after I start breathing. So that's important to to remember. But um, your oxygen saturation can stay fairly high for uh, the first bit into a breath hold. Um, so, you know, for some people, it might stay at 98% uh, for, for two minutes during a full, uh, a full lung breath hold. Um, but, and of course, with a, an exhale breath hold, you uh, reach lower saturations much quicker. And that's, the, that's, that's in part the reason why those uh, hypoxic squats are on exhale breath holds. It's so you don't have to hold forever while you're getting rid of your oxygen. Hey, look, we're going super geeky, super deep here really fast, yeah. So I'm kind of <laughs> laughing, but I'm scratching my own itch here and uh, I've read your book, so I'm kind of, we, but I think we've missed a huge part of it. I want to go back, but just <laughs> but just quickly, right? So yeah, sure. <laughs> I think I know what's coming. <laughs> yeah, your oxygen's desaturating, right? What 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 about the splenic contraction where you get that big injection of um of of fresh oxygen and hemoglobin that sort of your spleen dumps into the body when it hits a certain level. That's a good question. I don't think I've seen it. Uh, um... I don't think I've seen it in uh, in the graphs. Let's put it like that. I know it happens, but I haven't seen it in the graphs. Okay. All right. And, interesting. Uh, it, it's it's very much an unconscious effect that just slowly might become stronger as you dive more. But I can't. Uh, uh, I don't think it's something that um, would be worth trying to train separately. Do you want to replicate some of the best dives that you've ever experienced and capture some of those elusive species that only show up at certain times during the year? You need to go to Amazon and get yourself a Spiro log created by none other than Shrek and Turbo. Along with help from three experts that we've had on the show, we had Pat Swanson from New Zealand, Grant Ladle from Scotland, and Kevin Daly from the UK. These guys got on board, helped me create and craft a spearfishing log that can help you to replicate those days that stay strong in your memory but maybe they stay strong in your memory but you've forgotten some of the variables that culminated in that successful day so you can capture these details every day every time you go diving with a hundred templates in the Spiro log available on Amazon now Spearing Magazine. It is the world's best spearfishing magazine. If the Noob Spiro podcast was a magazine, it'd be Spearing Magazine. That's how good it is. And even better, it's great value for money. 
Jeremy, the head honcho at Spring Magazine, has just sent us an email and told us that, guys, you can get the eight-issue back catalogue for $30 US plus shipping. That's $3.75 a magazine plus shipping. That's a bloody bargain. So do yourself a favour. Get some fodder for the toilet. You know there's nothing else to do there but sit and read. Get some spearing magazines in there amongst all those Women's Weekly. It's going to be it's an absolutely fantastic mag. Check it out. Email Jeremy, J-E-R-O-M-Y, at spearingmagazine.com. All right, cool. Hey, look, let's take it right back to the, sort of the basics. I really liked how you opened the the book. You, you, you walk us through the perfect, the perfect dive. So can you do the same for us? So like obviously uh, a spearfishing dive profile is a little bit different than a free diver's one where you're just going down and coming back up. So can you kind of walk us through like a perfect spearfishing dive? Sure. Uh, what, what's happening I mean, in the body uh, during each of the phases and things like that? Right. Uh, well, if you, uh, you know, by the, if you're, you're totally calm and relaxed and you take that, uh, that full breath, before you get down, you don't hold any tension in your body. Then as soon as you start kicking down, you start depleting um, you, the reservoir in your muscles, which is uh, uh, high energy phosphates. And by about 10 to 15 seconds, all of that will be gone. So that's the uh, the energy reservoir that you use during the start of that dive. So that you've basically got 10 to 15 seconds before you want to start sinking down. Um, and of course, kind of depending on your depth. Now. As you start sinking down, most of your metabolism is still going to be aerobic, so you're uh, uh, you're gradually reducing whatever uh, blood is uh, in your legs still, and there's vasoconstriction, so that blood supply will be limited. Um, after that, myoglobin is going to be desaturated. So by now, you're uh, you're 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 stalking a fish, or you're lying on the um, on the bottom of the ocean, uh, looking at one, um, and of of course, uh, in, in a perfect uh, in a perfect world, you would uh, you would look at a 50 kilogram tuna and spear it <laughs> in the head. Uh, <laughs> it would be immobile. Yeah. Uh, and you start kicking it up, and then during that latter phase, during that ascent, uh, you'll start to increase your blood lactate, um, and uh, that is what's used in your muscle when you um, when you become anaerobic. So this is when a lot of people start feeling leg burn. Yeah. Um, That's or me. you start feeling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think uh, a lot a lot of us uh, unfortunately get it. Yeah. Um, but it's in you know in 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 parts that lactate is a good thing. It allows you to keep going without burning oxygen. It's all anaerobic. Um, and then you bring that fish up. You're still you still have. Uh, plenty in you not to uh, uh, not to have any problems at the surface and uh, and you breathe again. Okay, cool. So there's there's a couple of different phases going on there. So you... yeah, there are for sure. There's 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 phases where you will have you know different metabolic systems working for you, and that's really what what I try to do in the book. I try to break that down um, so that people can train the specifics. Yes, uh, of those. Yeah. Okay, so we've just saw what a, a kind of a really good, nice spearfishing dive looks like to sort of that 80 meters, 60 foot mark that a lot of guys sort of aim for, and it can be a big aim for the first couple of years. Um, mm -hmm. What what's what's the converse? What, what does a really bad dive look like? Uh, well, in spearfishing, there's uh, there's quite some ways and things you know, in which things can go south. But you know, let's let's imagine that. Uh, you just hold a little bit of tension and you're you're going down you start getting contraction somewhat earlier than you want maybe even before you hit the bottom and then you still you still stay down there um, you start feeling your your legs get a little tight or you know that start of the leg burn can feel somewhat weird that happens you still see a big fish you shoot it and now you've kind of at the end of your breath hold and suddenly you have to struggle with a fish because you shot him in the, in the belly or somewhere else and it's taking you for a ride. Um, you, you go back up, you realize the fish is tangled in some uh, coral or, or kelp uh, and you have to decide whether you're going to go back down or whether you are going to go up and leave your spear behind and try to get them back later. That, that for me is pretty bad spearfishing dive. This actually happened to me in uh, 
in the Maldives on when I was, I think I was only diving for a year and a half or so, maybe two. I shot a big grouper at 17 meters and uh, uh, it immediately got underneath a coral ledge. Uh, I didn't have the breath hold to get down and get it, get it out uh, and had to go back up. And we spent, I think, at least, you know, there were two of us. We spent probably 10 dives each trying to get that fish out. And of course, as, as I came up and then you're rushed and the current started to pick up. Yeah. Um, I got I, I got stuck in the line at one point as well. My buddy had to uh, to get me loose uh, during one of those dives. So that was, it was kind of nerve wracking. Uh, great buddy though. He he untangled me no problem. But um, you know, and then then suddenly you you're working with that stress as you're diving, right? It's very different than just chilling out on a line and trying to hit uh, a, a depth target. I find. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you've struck the. The difference between spearfishing and freediving on the head. I mean, I'm not. I'm not saying freedivers don't deal with poor visibility and and other problems, but sometimes in spearfishing, there's just that much going on. It's not funny. You're in current. A fish is holed up. You and your buddy are doing it. You've got lines and knives and equipment, and then there's stress, stress, and your 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 boaty's signalling you, and there's all sorts of stuff going on. And, um, yeah, exactly. I mean, this yeah. is one of the reasons why we keep it conservative generally and just, you know, dive much shallower than we actually could if we were just trying to hit a plate and come back up. But, um, yeah, you know, and in, in the depth competitions, but the spare fishers that suddenly decide to do free diving competitions, they tend to do very, very well. Yeah. yeah. Because I think because they have that comfort at depth already, you know, you have to be able to spend quite some time at depth in order to be a good spare fisher. Yeah, yeah. It's funny, like, there's not a lot of, like, high-level freedivers that spearfish prolifically. A lot of them have moved to freediving, and sometimes they segue out of spearfishing into, into freediving. You know, we spoke to Eras Beatis, and he's like that. And um, I, one guy in New Zealand that does it all the time is Dave Mullins, and uh, he seems mm -hmm. to hit phenomenal depth and shoot good fish as well. He's got it all going on, but um, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's definitely a difference between the sports. So from a, from a from a training point of view, there's not a lot you can do with some of those variables we face in spearfishing. What's kind of the most yeah. common things that guys should look to implement into their uh, into a training regime to help them, you know, be in the best possible shape for spearfishing? Um, well, it's a it's, it's a tricky one to answer. I guess it's you know if if um, if you every single time you come up your legs feel totally shot then. Uh, then you should probably start incorporating some sprints into your training, uh, mid-distance sprinting, um, in order to train. Because your body can become trained to deal with lactate, uh, with those high high levels of lactate. And um, there's there's actually two ways you can do that. You know, like, and it's important to realize here that those three metabolic systems you have, if one is not perfect, you can use another to take it over, to take over some of the uh, uh, some of the slack, say. To so, compensate, both, yeah. Uh, exactly, yeah. So it's again, it's kind of important to also find out what what is um, you know leverage your strength. Uh, don't try to fix your weaknesses too much. Um, that that's important. But you know, if if I were spear fishing, I would always come up with a lot of leg burn. Uh, then I would try to um, do some sprints, and uh, if I get too many contractions before uh, before I. Uh, see a snapper, then you know it's your CO2 tolerance, etc. Okay, cool. And there's actually I tried to I tried to really give people uh, a clear idea with that in the book. There's one section that I call troubleshooting, which is just a simple table with uh, you know things that if if you're getting this, then maybe try this or this. Yeah, um, no, it's it's definitely I, I'm I'm gonna link it up in the show notes so people can come and buy it. And I mean, we're only gonna get a snapshot of kind of the the ground you cover in this book, and it's it's a it's a thoroughly good read. It's just good to get some actionable stuff on the show. So the lactate and mid distance sprints is a good one, and some CO two tables for the guys that are getting early onset contractions. I think that's that's phenomenal. Um, I just wanted to read a, a quote out from the book. It says, um, the goal of training is to adapt the body to specific conditions. In freediving, the goal is to adapt the body to underwater conditions. These conditions include increased pressure, reduced oxygen, and increased carbon dioxide. And you say specific training is possible for all three of these conditions. So I would encourage people to get into that section of the book and work on the things 
that they, you know, where they are experiencing weakness. I mean, there's there's always an area of your diving you're working on. And with spearfishing, some guys, sometimes guys are just focused on improving their hunting, but at other times it's about improving their equalizing or their free diving. And this book is probably, it, it is the best resource I've, I've read for for um, tuning up your free diving and, and not, not just focusing on everything. You can actually dial in and train something specific. Um, for me, I've, I've added in some running, uh, just one session of running to clean up my blood. And, uh, and, there's, and I do some sprints as well because um, I was doing mostly weight, weight, weight workouts and I do a little bit of pull training with the Brisbane Bull Sharks. But, but um, yeah, I, I've, I've really found some value and made some adaptations to my kind of practice as a result of it. And I, I'm not an elite freediver and I, I, I don't think I ever want to be, but I definitely like being um, fit and, uh, and feeling good when I go spearfishing, that's for sure. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm glad you were getting some value from it. Um, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, I, I started, uh, I, I wrote this really in a way out of personal interest. And then at some point, or that's where I was doing the research and tests. And I realized that, uh, that there, you know, this was turning into something that just could be written up into a book. And I'm, I'm just super happy that people will actually enjoy it and find some, uh, some use in it. Yeah. We, we, we joke around, we've got a book called 99 tips to get better at spearfishing and, we always joke around that it's just actionable information, and I found your book to be kind of like that for freediving, so it's pretty cool. Um, all right, so I, I talked a little bit about how I brought cardio and specifically some. Um, I'm not running long distance, like I think I went out for a four kilometer run the other night, and it, it took me like 20 something minutes. <laughs> yeah, that's a great that's a great aerobic workout. You know, it's uh, that in. Your your the whole lactic and high energy phosphates those are going to be uh, uh, they're not going to be a big part of a run like that. So if you're if you're doing three kilometer runs or four kilometer or five or six whatever that's uh, it all helps, right? Yeah. Well, your book encouraged me because um, it talks about um, when you do cardio, your blood volume increases straight away, and and it improves right, and yeah. it improves the quality of your blood. How does that? Yeah. How does it kind of? How does that mechanism work? What's actually happening in your body? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I might be. Yeah, we might be getting into detail about my pay grade here. But. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, um, I'll, I'll leave that I've, question I've, behind. <laughs> yeah. There is no. There is. Uh, it's. It's. It's an interesting um, uh, uh, response of the body, and I'm not. I'm not quite sure what. what why it does that i mean the blood quality makes sense the blood volume um I'm, I'm, it doesn't uh it doesn't make as much sense to me i guess as the quality because quality is just the percentage of red blood cells right those are the ones that transport the oxygen etc um there is uh increased blood volume you know you could um dissolve some more co2 in that etc but the the important thing is that the change is there and um, cardio is great. Uh, there are some studies that have shown that 35 minutes of exercise per week, uh, period, and no matter what exercise, although a combination of cardio and, uh, and weights seem to be best, that that is already enough to kind of boost those, those levels. But, um, but cardio, uh, cardio is the best booster in a way yes. of, uh, of that blood volume and it's good for all sorts of other things it, it actually increases the elasticity of your blood vessels uh which might be good for us as well uh, might be you know better vasoconstriction that way um it's good for your uh the how your um how your heart and uh and respiratory system work together etc yeah I, I was training heavy weights three or four times a week and then doing some um free diving training with a with a with a specific pool training group here in Brisbane, and um, but I felt like I was missing something, and so I've definitely added in, uh, I've added in two cardio sessions a week. One's a run because that's about all my knees can take is one good run a week, and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'm only 37, but you wouldn't know it. But uh, and the second one I, I added in was um, was a was a proper swimming session, like just just cardio swimming, not free dive training. So uh, yeah, swimming is fantastic too for uh, CO2 tolerance. Yeah, okay. Because you're altering your breathing? Yeah, you have to alter your breathing, right? So uh, it tends to be just a little slower than, uh, than it is when you're going for a, for a run. Yeah, and I'm, I'm still trying to work out how to mix up uh, my cadence, like 
how, how fast I should swim, the distances and things like that. I think at the moment I'm just flat out doing 100 metres and then having a, you know, 20, 30 second breather and then going again. <laughs> Yeah, but, uh, yeah, I'm hardly a picture of fitness, but uh, yeah. Hey, look, look. Let, let's get into exercises because I think one of the other things um, that that was sort of got right into me when I read the book was how much exercise and pictures and practical stuff you've got in there for stretching and warming up and things like that. We've already talked about hypoxic squats and and cardio. What about um, some stretching and uh, in particular scratching my own itch for 37 year old weapons. Uh, yeah, well, the um, uh, stretch is, you know, the, the, the re I've got a section in the book, uh, which is, uh, which is animal walks, which is a, a um, it's a warm up, right? I talk about it as a warm up. And it's, I think it's a great warm up. That is actually a way to really effectively stretch your um, stretch muscles that tend to get tight in all of us. And, uh, and that's really the reason why that warm up is in there. And if you have, uh, so, you know, these, a lot of these are going to be difficult for most people, but you can cheat in all of them. You don't have to do them perfectly. Right. So, um, uh, so, so that's, um, I guess that's part of more general stretching, which will help with your overall health as you age. Uh, so if you can, if you can incorporate, say, five even or 10 minutes of animal walks just uh, uh, in, in the morning or at some time of day, then uh, you're, that's really going to benefit anyone. Yeah, I found, um, I found some of the animal walks a little bit like stuff stuff you just did mucking around when you were kids, but when you actually do it now, like um, I think the gorilla walk, is it? And, uh, oh, the ape walk, yeah. I, I found that was really amazing for like my hip flexors. And, uh, yeah. It's a big part of what you do when you when you when you when you when you're spearfishing and stuff. It's finning, and so stretching that right out in a sort of a, a movement type exercise was really cool. I liked it. The other one I tried was the crab walk, which is kind of mm -hmm. like um, ba backwards with your ha walking along the ground, sort of with your with your back to the floor, using your hands and your feet to sort of get along. I can't do it. Yeah, it's a bit masochistic, but. Um <laughs> the crosswalk is, you know, the uh, what you maybe can try. So it is a it is a difficult exercise, and my my crab walk doesn't look very pretty, um, and it doesn't have to, right? So the ideal uh, in in an ideal crab walk, your knees, your hips, and your shoulders are in line. Uh, your 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 uh, elbows are uh, straight, and um, your, your fingers are pointing. Uh, towards your back, I guess, or, or uh, pointing in the direction of where your head is. Um, but if you can do it that way, uh, try to um, try to lower your hips a bit and try to uh, do it with your hands uh, pointing towards your feet, and that will make it much easier. Uh, it, it'll it'll reduce the amount of uh, shoulder mobility and, and flexibility you need in your uh, uh, in your uh, what are those things called? Triceps. Ah, yeah. And that might be uh, might be part of, uh, if you say you've done a lot of weightlifting over the years, that might be part of why it's not really working out for you. Yeah, okay. I def I, was, <laughs> I tried to do it as my warm-up at the gym, and uh, I just uh -huh. I just found the the looks from people, <laughs> from people just <laughs> yeah. put me off completely. Like, some people looked at me like, what? They were, like, starting to talk to each other, like, what is this guy doing? I was like... <laughs> Yeah, you, you got to be a little stubborn about these things sometimes. <laughs> you do, you do, and I, and I don't, I don't mind normally uh, getting right out of my comfort zone, but it was just, uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was a bit awkward. But anyway, um, yeah. <laughs> do you, Good do on you, you for trying. Yeah, do you do some of the yoga stuff as well, like um, child's pose and downward dog? Some of these things is that something you you look at oh, as yeah. an after dive kind of thing? You know, I like to be moving around when I'm stretching. Yeah. Uh, so, so I I tend to do those animal walks mostly, and um, so you, there's other range of motion exercises that I do. So I don't tend to do a lot of uh, yogic stretching. I I like meditating and um, and pranayamas, but I don't tend to move around. So I I do my stretching separate from from the yoga i guess Ah, okay okay interesting mm -hmm. so but you'll do animal work animal walks like pre-workout and post-workout 
Yeah, I, I, you know, I just tend to do uh, whatever's bothering me. I, I, I kind of live life injury to injury, unfortunately. <laughs> and it's maybe just from, from getting into all these different uh, exercises and overdoing them. But uh, um, I tend to have a morning routine that revolves around what I need to train. So uh, uh, right now I'm, um, I, I do more of the, uh, um, uh, oh, I, I forget the name now. It's a downward dog-like animal walk. Okay. Um, oh, I've got the I've got the book here. Let me pull it out for you. <laughs> yeah, don't tell me. <laughs> Remind me what's in it again. Oh no, this is it. Like you forget. Um, that's why you got to write that's it down. The, the bear walk. The bear oh, walk. The bear walk. Right, okay. That's the one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the bear walk. I tend to do a lot of those because it really stretches out what's very tight in me, and that's the uh, my calves and my and my hamstrings. Okay. And that's holding me back a bit uh, uh, okay. in my running, actually. So, so you know, I, it's, um, I, and I've got the section on a morning routine in the book as well. So I tend to, uh, the, my stretches and my, um, tend to revolve around whatever I'm working on and I'll do a bit of them every morning. Okay, cool. You know, I liked yeah. it. I, I, I liked it. Um, I, th- I thought all of the different animal walks f- focused on different areas of your body and, um, I had a couple that were bugbears for me, and that probably means that I need to do some mobility type work to sort of free myself up. And uh, that's one of the good things about training, I guess. You you have this sort of sense of awareness about these things. If, like many of us, you can't get along to a free dive training group or free diving course, then check out howtofreedive.com. This is a great online resource uh, for you to learn basically the physiology of what's happening in your body and also training techniques and what you need to improve your breath hold. Uh, There's spreadsheets, there's tracking, the whole thing's involved. It's absolutely fantastic. I've used the five-minute free dive course to improve my breath hold before spearfishing trips. Found it highly valuable. The best thing is there's a free taster course for you so you don't actually have to part with any cash. Check out the free taster course if you like it. Go on, do the course. I recommend it. And you can also use the code NoobSpear at checkout. You'll save 20%. It's a bit of a no-brainer. Give it a taste. Have a crack. Let's let's move into diet. So the other thing I notice is you love myth busting, don't you? Yeah, well, I like challenging assumptions. Yeah. Oh, challenging um, assumptions. Is that is that what you used to say to the school teachers as well? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> That's well, you know, when you're in the, when you're in, I think when you're when you're in science, when you're pursuing a PhD, you get yeah, uh, kind of habitated to trying to find out which ideas are based on solid research and which aren't, and that's really. Uh, that's, I guess, that has become how I read things and how I try to read between the lines. So, um, so yeah, I do. I do try to figure out what, what you know, what part of a fad diet is fad and what is actually legit. Yeah, cool. So, I mean, we chatted about slow carb diet, which is kind of as made famous by Tim Ferriss in the Four Hour Body, which is a great mm-hmm. book. Well, I'll link that up in the show notes as well because he really he takes the self experimentation model to another level as as you did with yeah totally in specific with freediving which is really cool uh, i found the books almost complimentary to be honest like but this one's just oh, really? just for freediving <laughs> yeah yeah no because you use the tools you develop these um scenarios and these these tests to actually measure what what works and what doesn't um so i mean let's go into diet so you've had some success with the slow carb diet what is the slow carb diet the slow carb diet is a diet in which you eliminate um, fa- fast carbs and fast carbs being sugars and um, and uh, carbs that uh, digest quickly, like rice, uh, like potatoes, grains. So uh, it is a diet in which you are allowed carbs, but you only eat uh, beans and lentils as carbs. And then, of course, the carbs that are in vegetables, etc. And this is basically a type of um, low GI diet, so a low blood glucose diet. It's it, it's aimed at controlling your blood glucose. With the with the cheat day though, do you do the cheat day? 
I did the cheat day when I was on the slow carb. Yeah, I loved it. <laughs> so in this in in Tim Ferriss form of uh, of this diet, you have uh, you're very strict for six days, and then you go, you know, you eat whatever you want on day seven, and that kind of makes that diet manageable. And you get yeah, that, and, and, and you get that insulin spike as well, which sort of resets your body, and then you're good to go again. Um, yeah, yeah, the sugar, the sugar high, and it, yeah, exactly. His his idea is that it helps you to, uh, you know, you won't get into a state in which you will always just burn through less um, energy because that would yeah. be bad for weight loss too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, that, and Tim Ferriss's diet, that slow carb diet, is really it's really meant for people that are trying to lose weight. Yeah, I like it. I, I think it's uh, yeah, it's a good it's a good technique, and I've tried a lot of these other ones as well. Right. So in your book, you myth bust the alkaline diet and the dairy mucus diet. So the alkaline diet is to try and make your body uh, have a higher pH level and less acidic. Is that right? Uh, it's the uh, yes, that's right. It's the idea is that uh, the idea is that by eating certain foods that will uh, uh, you know become uh, or that will turn into acids or that are acidic. Um, Complete BS. That's, that's going to be, like, yeah, exactly. Complete like, BS. So that's, that's bad for you. And, and the, the idea, you know, uh, an alkaline diet, for most people, it simply means eating a lot of vegetables, uh, not a lot of sugars, and not a lot of fat. And so for a lot of people, this does a lot of good. But in the end, um, I think the underlying theory of it is simply incorrect. And in the original, in the original uh, 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 way that this was interpreted, is that the body actually had some kind of reservoir of acid that was gonna do you harm in the long run. But you know, it's well, where's the reservoir? All right. So we've debunked yeah. the alkaline diet. What about carbs? Are they bad for you? As and what about dairy as well? Well, let's do dairy too. Dairy, yeah. Well, dairy, a lot of people think that dairy will increase mucus production. But um, in, that's been tested with several by several scientists and they did not find a, a connection. So I think the idea that dairy produces mucus uh, is, is incorrect. But um, what has been shown is that dairy will temporarily make your mucus stickier. So if you have, you say, a glass of milk before your dive, you might end up, you know, ending up with a bit more phlegm that's, uh, um, that makes you want to swallow during your dive or, or some, other, um, some other issue. For me, it doesn't really, doesn't really matter much. But, um, you know, in the Netherlands, we eat uh, ridiculous amounts of yogurt and drink insane quantities of milk and, and dairy all around. So I guess that was one I really wanted to... Uh, to debunk too. Yeah, yeah, because he wanted to eat lots of cheese as well. Come on, <laughs> <Yeah>. that's right. <laughs> um, so you you see this? I see this commonly online. Like guys will say, oh, "I've got my left ear won't equalize when I you know get below ten meters or something like this," and the other guys will be like, "Don't eat any dairy and avoid alcohol the day before." Um, one of the big yeah. things with the equalizing problems is hydration. Um, guys become incredibly dehydrated as they go spearfishing and if they don't drink any water before they get up and go spearfishing in the morning then they're already dehydrated by the time they hit the water and you know you're in the water all day so you're urinating and you probably you know it's a downward cycle I think that's one of the biggest impacts I think on equalization but so okay so dairy <laughs> debunked it alkaline diets crap carbs are they bad carbs well there you get you know that's uh uh, it's, um, can't really say yes or no there. What is carbs are not necessarily bad, but what is bad is being completely reliant on them. So uh, you know what you want to be is some what I like to think of as being metabolically flexible. And that's a term I first heard from Pete Atia, who's uh, done a lot of uh, self experimenting with the ketogenic diet. And um, so. Um, you know what? In the ideal world, you would be able to have a big breakfast with a bunch of sugar if you want, and start running. Uh, by the time your uh, your blood glucose goes below a certain level, or even at the start, your body's uh, your 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 legs start burning through fatty acids. And uh, after eight hours of running, you you get you automatically go into ketosis and you start burning through ketones. That's ideal, right? But most of us 
are so used to eating carbs that we hit the proverbial wall and uh, just slow down and need to eat a high energy gel or 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 just want to eat whatever is in the fridge and in that case uh being reliant on carbs is not good you know if you're able to spearfish uh for most of the day not having to rely on carbs uh, you have to eat less and you're not any worse off for it but it's it's because of our diets you know um we drink uh, some sugary, maybe maybe tea, uh, sugar in your tea in the morning, and a bunch of bread, and then you eat some uh, cookies for uh, during coffee time or whatever. Um, that will make you reliant on carbs. Or a bag of Doritos in my case. But <laughs> exactly, yeah, all but, the uh, good stuff. <laughs> but I was just going to say, so like when you have a he heavy carb diet, your body relies on like glucose as its primary food. Uh, uh, energy and then when you switch over into ketosis which you when your body hasn't had any um, glucose f food or food containing it for a long time then your body switches over into burning fat which is ketones and, and yeah well it's, there's there's a there's a little bit of a difference uh fats don't equal ketones um and and uh, the reason is that your muscles can burn through normal fat cells okay uh, but your brain cannot yeah. So by the time that your brain doesn't have enough glucose anymore, that's when your liver needs to start using fats to make ketones so that your brain has something to burn. But again, your muscles can function on that as well. So there's an intermediate phase there where your brain will be working on glucose, but your muscles on free fatty acids. And then at some point, there's going to be a switch to ketosis. And that switch can be kind of painful for for a lot of people. Or not, pain, not literally painful, but just just plain crappy, right? Uh, uh, ketosis is, uh, is, is, is not a diet to take lightly in a way. Um, it's hard to get into, it's hard to adapt to, uh, and it really, really restricts what you can eat. So, uh, uh, like, I'm, I'm a bit of a fan of intermittent fasting, and um, it, oh, yeah. Yeah. When, you, when you fast for long enough, you, your body will go into a state of ketosis anyway without any sort of prodding. And uh, but last time I did a fast, I did a forty-eight hour fast, and I just had a crap time the whole time. I don't think I ever went into ketosis. I just um, was <laughs> groggy, low energy, grumpy, and that's not really like me. I, I can normally fast pretty easy, but I, I didn't switch over. So it's it's funny how your body responds sometimes. But I was going to say, like when you go spe when yeah. I go spearfishing, often I won't eat until you know much later in the morning. So I might have been diving for four or five hours, and my, I seem oh, to. Yeah. I seem to thrive on that, you know, like, you know, empty stomach, so your digestive system's not working, um, so your body's using less energy, I guess, and um, you, it seems to be much easier to dive. Is that something that you've sort of looked at? Yeah, well, what, uh, you know, what, what some people like to do, and um, again, actually, this is, uh, I think Tim Ferriss wrote something about this, about um, how he switches into ketosis, uh, in his latest or one of his later books, uh, Tools of Titans, um, and basically after you uh, after you sleep, right? You've already done a part of the fast, and it, it's really easy because you just you've been sleeping, so yeah, your body yeah. is doing uh, is doing part of the hard work for you while you're while you're uh, while you're passed out, and uh, uh, that helps. Uh, I think also uh, that uh, being in uh, in water might help because you lose quite some heat. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if that's, you know, I, it's not something I've tested, but I've, uh, I've done a lot of, um, I, I used to do quite some ice baths as well while I was doing the ketosis and I got the sense that it, uh, it actually helped kickstart okay. ketosis sometimes. Yeah. So you got into Wim Hof as well. <laughs> Oh yeah, I tried it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, interesting. Might as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It sounds like you've got into a few of the guests he's had on his podcast, like Peter Atia and uh, Wim Hof as well. So that's pretty cool. Uh, there's definitely uh, some good. I didn't realize you had Peter Atia on the podcast. That yeah, shit was about. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, it's very good for you know learning about higher end physiology and stuff like that. A lot of it's far outside of my depth, but um, I, I'm interested anyway. All right, hey, let, let's, let's, let's move on to tools. So in the book, you used a number of tools to conduct these kind of tests and stuff on yourself. Um, mm -hmm. what, what, yeah, what, the, what would you recommend to guys like as a baseline if they want to start seriously um, tracking and improving their freediving performance? 
Oof. Well, that's it. It all starts with a notebook and a pencil. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Because um, you really want to keep track of uh, what you're doing. You know, if you want to find what exercises work well for you, you need to keep. You need to start tracking metrics. So I really encourage people to get uh, some kind of diary. And even if you just, you know, you've had a spear fishing session and you write down how you felt. Uh, uh, and and maybe what you ate uh, that morning or whatever, or what kind of exercise you've been doing that past week, that after a certain amount of time, you will get some insight from that. So that's number one. Um, if you want to train with an uh, oximeter, uh, then you need to get one of those, which is a, is a cheap tool. Um, it's, you know, you can get these things for 20 to 40 bucks. And I've, I actually haven't, I haven't found there to be much difference between oximeters from from twenty to fifty dollars. There's a bit of a difference once you get to the, the the more expensive medical ones, but you you might you you probably don't really need it. Yeah. Um, so an oximeter is another one. If you if you want to do the hypoxic squats, do a T, and you really want to know whether you're desaturating your muscle of oxygen, you could get a moxie, but. Um, moxie is that is that near infrared spectrometer that. Uh, um, tests muscle oxygenation it, it just measures where you want to measure rather than that uh, arterial oxygenation and it's a direct measurement um, that though is uh, is expensive and most people won't won't get one it's it's uh, I believe it retails for 990 US dollars right now or so so um, <laughs> I'm getting one tomorrow <laughs> well I think um, <laughs> you, you're almost you know, you have to be pretty hardcore about your experimental mindset if you're if you're going to invest that sort of money in it. But you did it, so people will do it. Well, I ended up renting one okay. at a local physio physiological center, so I got some help uh, uh, that way, and um, that worked for me. I'd like to in in some time, I'd like to get one and test other free divers as well, um, see some you know how these things compare in in, uh, in other divers. What are the general times we should use for these exercises? But that's 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 future, uh, you know. And otherwise, most of these trainings that I've got or the exercises I have in the book, they they can be done with very little. Uh, some you need some weights for, and or you know just your local gym will have everything. Yep. Yep. I saw pictures of you in there doing a deadlift. Pretty good form. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you have to when you're doing a photo for a book. So um, yeah, well, that's right. Better do this right, you know. But uh, I I haven't done a deadlift now for quite a while. Actually, it was funny when uh, when I did do a lot of those because I was testing whether it would really work. It it was actually the thing that worked the best for me in order to increase my time. And I think that's because I dive with an eight millimeter suit and it's also, uh, I really gain muscle very, very easily. So when I, and I think I wrote that in the book as well, I, uh, I actually grew out of my pants um, when I was trying to uh, train my legs. So, um, oh, finally going back to the ice baths. Uh, so my, my legs were so puffed up and the measurements came back, you know, in a way that it, it was easy to see that this had a positive effect on, uh, uh, on muscle or I'm sorry, on, uh, on blood oxygenation. Um, so then I tried to get rid of that and all I did was I skipped uh, my breakfast and, uh, I had a, a no carb lunch and I took, uh, I think ice baths and you ranging from five to 15 minutes a day and within, uh, a month and a half i was back to my original size oh wow wow okay, very interesting yeah. yeah i've yet to do the ice bath thing uh, i did cold showers for a long time um but it's something i want to look at this year uh there's de def definitely some benefits in that uh so cool all right so sounds like there's a lot of stuff guys can do without a lot of equipment so that's pretty cool so again just check out the book and you'll learn a whole lot more um all right, let's move on to some funnier stuff, some lighthearted stuff. What's the most annoying shit freedivers free or Sparrows do? Um, well, for Sparrows, uh, it's annoying uh, bordering on uh, uh, on homicidal is uh, to strap a GoPro to your spear gun and then try to film your buddies. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, um, that's a bad one. Yeah, that's... Uh, that's that's uh, that's a bad one. Especially uh, if they have a spear gun like yours. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Um, 
and um, for free divers, I think it's uh, what what uh, what bugs me sometimes is. Uh, but maybe it's because I'm grumpy to start with on the, on those days. It's just uh, talking too much while I'm trying to breathe up or uh, <laughs> or in between the eyes. <laughs> uh, I'm so guilty of that. When when we're doing the pool training stuff, I normally have a you know a couple of lanes full of full of guys, and we're just having a laugh. And I, I'm terrible at distracting people. Um, everyone's, you know, you're trying to get a good breathe up and, you know, do a good, good, you know, whatever the exercise is. It might, you might be on tables or something horrible like that. And here's me making jokes and stuff like that. So yeah, 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 exactly. guilty yeah. as charged. So you're one of those. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I didn't really talk about the elephant in the room this whole episode. I just, I just want to go there for a sec. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 book, the book is called Longer and Deeper. Um, Freudian slip, what, what, what's going on here? <laughs> or, or is it just clever marketing? I, I got a few, well, I was telling a few people about it and they had a laugh at the title. So you must get yeah, out of it. Sure. Well, it's, I, was, I was aware of what I did there, I guess, and I thought it was pretty funny. Yeah. But at the same time, um, uh, uh, I do. I I wanted a title that was short and that people would remember. Uh, you know, there are books called Training for Free Diving or something similar. Um, so I wanted. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted something that that would stand out, and this uh, I think this one this one did it. That did, man, for sure. It's a memorable title. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder what they're finding when they search in Google. Yeah, it, it's also in, in a way it was also. Uh, it was meant to help marketing because, uh, you know, whatever title you have, if it is something that people will talk about on social media, that'll help with um, getting the word out, right? For sure. Yeah, no, it's, you've got to have a good title. Um, the other thing it's got, which is even more important, is good content. Um, so, like I said, I was really impressed. I was stoked when I, uh, when I started reading it. it was, and it, it wasn't too long either. I found a lot of the other freediving books really daunting and like almost like you had to be a doctor to understand parts of it. And, uh, I mean, your books, I'm just looking at it now. It's 180 pages, and it's just good info, cover to cover. There's no fluff and bullshit in there. It's just uh, just good <laughs> stuff. And, and Thanks, a lot of Spiros are not interested really in, in hardcore, high-end freediving stuff. Like we started talking about some of your equalizing troubles at the at the start, and I mean when you get below thirty meters, the the problems and the techniques you need to learn become pretty hardcore. But for most of us, it's not what we're about. We just want sort of actionable stuff we can do to make our spear fishing mm -hmm. around. I found I found yeah. I found longer and deeper to, to do that, so it was pretty cool. Hey, I, I wanted to ask you: Did you have any unexpected uh, conclusions or findings from all the research you did about apnea training? Uh, yes, I did. Well, the, the one thing really um, that I wasn't expecting was that uh, was how hard it actually is to get your muscles deoxygenated on land. And I was really trying for a, I was really searching for an exercise that would do that. And that's, uh, you know, so I was I, in that physiologic testing center. I was trying all sorts of squats, one leg stands, exhaustive sprints on breath hold, et cetera, to, to nearly to the point of having to walk to the, uh, uh, to walk to puke my guts out. And, um, and it just didn't do it. So it's, you know, it's very hard to get the oxygen out of your muscles unless you have a dive reflex going for you, which you won't have on land. So, um, that's, that's how those hypoxic squats came out and, and they ended up being for me being very, uh, useful training and really helped me with my diving. It seems to definitely be one of the, the bigger ticket wins in the book. So that's pretty cool. What, are, what are you curious about right now? What are you working on? What am I working on? Well, I got, I got a few. Um, I got a few things that I am working on. Uh, one thing that I've been busy with the past few days and uh, I've been thinking about for, for a long time is designing a new monofin, uh, which is a foil, so it's a hydrodynamic fin. Um, I dive with one already, which it's called the Orca Dolphin, um, and um, uh, it's, it's uh, so a foil is basically a wing. Yeah, um, hydrofoil meaning a wing underwater. Um, so, you know, our, our fins, uh, I, I, I think our bifins, especially for freedivers, they just they just don't they don't cut it. 
And uh, there's nothing there's nothing hydrodynamic about those things. They're too long. They create a lot of drag. There's a lot of leverage on your ankles and your and your legs. And so, so a monofin. But my old ones practically falling apart. So I'm I've been designing some parts, uh, and I'm gonna get them 3D printed pretty soon to start testing. Wow, awesome. Um, that's one thing. Uh, I've also started researching for a possible second book about the uh, mindset of extreme athletes. Okay. Um, and Luca, my uh, business partner with Freedive Wire, and I were working on a, on a training manual for pool training. Cool. Um, what else? Yeah, just the general. Like We're, we're working on some articles. I'm working on a, a set of pretty uh, in-depth posts about uh, lactate and cardio and CO2. Uh, one of them is uh, going to be published on Deeper Blue, I hope, pretty soon. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, we're working some more on gear review articles as well. So that's 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 everything I'm doing, which is <laughs> I feel uh, that's enough. Not my not not my day job and uh, not the parenting stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, you got you got kids uh, as well. Yeah, I have a I have a uh, eight month old. Yeah, oh, eight wow. month old daughter now. So it's uh, she's she's uh, taking up a lot of my time which yeah. is uh, not a bad thing it's a lot of fun no nah, it's a pleasant thing it's good it's good all right um i really liked having a look at free dive wire and there's um like if you want really in-depth hardcore articles like there's a really good one in there about wetsuits from the materials where they come from how they're made there was there was it went really 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 into depth and i was pretty impressed with the kind of how far you guys went with it. Um, so I'd encourage people to go and check that out, freedivewire.com. Hopefully we're going to have you um, back again, Yup, and we're going to talk about some articles that you, you guys are writing on and working on in the future. And um, I really enjoyed this book. I'm looking forward to anything else you guys do in the future. So it'll be good to um, regularly touch base with you and, uh, and just share s kind of some of the things you're learning. Sure, sounds great. Where, where can people find you online, man? Um, well, I'm pretty bad with social media and all that stuff. So the uh, best way, uh, I mean, I, I do check messages on uh, Facebook and we have an Instagram channel, Free Dive Wire, uh, and a Facebook page as well. So I, I'll check those messages. You can also, you can always email to info at freedivewire.com for, you know, any uh, suggestions for articles or just a touch base. Um, and um, yeah, that's that's really it. That's perfect, man. Oh, yeah. I've had a ball. Mm -hmm. um, was there anything else I did not ask you that you wish I had today? Uh, we covered quite a lot of ground here, I think. We did. We got into the weeds and uh, <laughs> I scratched my own itch, which I quite often do. And probably, you know, like for some of the guys, um, you know, the physiology stuff is just a bit beyond them. But for other guys, they might have enjoyed it. So I enjoyed it anyway. And uh, I Excellent. I hope the community did as well. So awesome. Yep. Thanks for chatting with me today. Thank you. We did it, guys. Yarp a bus over and out. Bloody, what a wicked interview. Good chat. I definitely scratched my own personal itch, so apologies for all the personal questions. I hope you got a ton out of it, though. Longer and Deeper, available on Amazon. Phenomenal book. Get yourself a copy. It's in today's show notes. Also, hey, we're off to chat with Ted Hardy, the founder of Immersion Freediving, all over again. Now, he's got a new website coming out called freedivingsafety.com. He's got free courses on there for Spiros. He won an award last year, and with the proceeds of that, he, is, uh, he has developed some new training for guys just to specifically to help him. He's one of the best spearfishing educators in the world, huge heart for the community, and it'll be great to have him back and uh, pump him for more tips and info for Spiros everywhere. We're going to cover Bulletproof Buddy Protocol and get some specific examples of where having a buddy is more likely to land you a fish. And uh, love it, I love it. Love chatting to Ted, so that's gonna be a cracker. Hey, um, also, just quickly, uh, Patreon. If you jump on there, support the New Spirit Podcast, that'd be fantastic. There's three levels, two bucks, five bucks, 10 bucks. At the moment, if you support us $2 an episode, that will cost you the grand total of $52 a year. But uh, definitely the eight patrons on there are helping to power the show. They are helping us to create this free content, free show for everyone. So definitely big thanks to those guys. Thank you to our patrons. And last but not least, thank you for sharing the show. It's on the social. I see people recommending it. I love it. I love to see that. And uh, love to see the growth in the show and see new guys come to listen to the show every week. So thanks, guys. Over and out. Track. Now, I don't know about you, 
but I love new gear. And spearfishing.com.au have got a huge range. Mad flat shipping rate, especially in Australia. And if you use the code NoobSpero, you not only support us, but you get $20 off every purchase over $200. That's right, pump in the code NoobSpero at checkout, N-O-O-B-S-P-E-A-R-O, at spearfishing.com.au and you will save 20 bucks on every purchase over $200. No-brainer. Thanks, Adrenaline.